I wanted to return to the original, the world of Ghost in the Shell a bit more. The, the original was something that, when I first saw it, very, <coughs> really kind of caught my imagination and inspired me in a kind of, in its, in its language. And so I kind of went back through, I took a lot of stills from the original Innocent Standalone Complex and I started to kind of collage a story. Um, I'm not a very good writer, but I kind of know what I want it to say without being able to say it. So I wrote kind of, you know, the story and, and did it like a, a graphic novel, like a 110 page graphic novel. And then I showed him that and it kind of it very clearly laid out the storyline and the type of story in the world and the visual aesthetic of it. The anime to me has a certain feeling to it that, that I think is very, um, very Japanese, but very science fiction. And it exists in a, you know, it's borrowed from pro popular culture and now as much as it's been borrowed from. And you see a lot of uh, Blade Runner in there, you know, and then The Matrix borrowed quite, quite heavily from it. So it's kind of, it's one of those other kind of, you know, uh, bookmarks along the history of, of kind of science fiction cinema. And I feel we're just another kind of uh, part of the legacy. You know, we're not reinventing it, we're just, we're, we're doing due diligence to it and we are continuing that legacy, hopefully, in a, in a respectful way. As a filmmaker, it's great to start from something that, that, that inspires you. And so many of those, those images were a great kind of cornerstone for us, you know, taking on that legacy. And we didn't want to reinvent it from the ground up, but we also didn't want to copy it frame for frame. And her character so fundamentally what's so kind of exciting about her. She's so kind of powerful and sexual and she's non-human and she's machine. Um, that it's, it's, it's very intoxicating. You know, a lot of the scenes we kept in there, you know, we kept um, the gynoid geisha, um, we kept the, the, the trash truck, um, we kept some of the, um, the, the, the Hanker Corporation. So there's a lot of stuff in there. There's, you know, little things that as a fan I was obsessed with, like the Uzis coming out of briefcases that, that drop away, just leaving the handle of the gun. And just little things, the tank's still in there. Um, so we kind of kept, you know, I think to me, what were the most iconic pieces and, and, and built the rest of the universe narratively to fit it. Ghost in the shell is, in its simplest terms, the ghost is the human essence, the soul, and the shell is the, the machinate body, the carapace into which she's put. So the original ghost in the shell starts with a human brain being put into a machinate body. And that, to me, as a, as a filmmaker, was an exciting kind of dynamic to explore. You know, where did that brain come from? Uh, what does that brain still think? What does that brain still remember? What is that brain told to remember? Can you reprogram a human brain the same way, the same way you can reprogram a machine ape brain, you know, a computer? And I think it's a kind of, you know, it's a very interesting metaphor of where we are today and, you know, how we are letting ourselves <coughs> be entirely consumed by technology and, and, and how, does our, how does our soul, how does our shell Sorry, how does our ghost, how does our, um, our essence survive when everything around it is, is machine -ate? So we start with our lead, lead character, the, the major, played by Scarlett Johansson, who is a, uh, a cyborg. She's got a human brain and a machine -ate body, and she is tasked with trying to track down um, the villain of the piece, really, who has um, the opening scene of the film has hacked into a group of hanker scientists and stolen data from their brains through these uh, hacked geishas whose heads explode and and viscerally kind of engorge the data out of out of out of them. So that kind of leads the mystery of who is this guy, what's he taking, and why is he taking it? And so her and her team, Section Nine, go down this road of trying to find who this guy is. But as she journeys down the road, she starts to un understand that her path and his path are, are closer than she thought, and, and she starts to understand not only what she is, but who she was before. It's in a kind of retro future in a way. I mean, some of the technology is very uh, kind of, we have 70s cars and 80s cars and 90s machine guns and 
and lots of cables, but then we're able to communicate telepathically through technology. So it's, it's kind of its own, its own world. There's no date on it, 2097 or something. It's just, it's, it's, it's a parallel, parallel universe. We wanted to make something grounded. I try and use very little green screen. I try and create real environments as much as possible. And then a lot of this film, we've used miniatures, sets, real cities we shot in Hong Kong for three weeks. And then we augment digitally on top of that instead of just putting people in a green room and creating everything digitally. So I think it's very, um, very important to me that you feel like that world exists, that you can, that you can touch it, that you can relate to it. Because the stor stories are, are complicated in science fiction. You need to, them to exist in a place where people feel that, that, they, um, that they could exist themselves. Well, Section Nine is is really the, the the team that Major works for. They're they're the kind of elite um, cyber terrorist kind of squad. They're the equivalent to a kind of SEAL team who deal in cyber terror in, in an urban environment, um, and they are all chosen for their specific enhancements and skill sets, and they kind of. Um, bolster her unit so she's got a small but but highly trained tactical unit and then Hanker is um, the biggest kind of and most uh, widely visible um, robotic uh, company that deals with enhancements and, and, and uh, cyber enhancements and, and robotics so they built the major they build a lot of the, the technology throughout the film um, and they are, I guess, the kind of the warm, fuzzy face of technology that, that everyone has basically, you know, opened themselves to. Scarlett and I had a lot of conversations about, you know, so many aspects of the character, so many facets of the character, the idea that it's a younger woman's brain, a, young, a girl's brain and a woman's body, um, that she has a body that she's that she that's trying to reject her brain you know the physicality of the shell rejecting the ghost and they're trying to keep them together um, you know how much of her is robotic versus how much of her is human you know how does that kind of how do those behaviors manifest themselves and what does she you know how does she um, try to get back to that humanity you know it's it's an interesting it's you know and Scarlett did bring so much to it she's um, really inhabited the role and bought a kind of a childlike quality to it, which I think is very important. You know, it really is a kind of um, Pinocchio story in a way, um, and 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 I think it's a, it, it was a very hard thing to do because it's you know you have to bring emotion to that character, and you you can't just be the the original. She's very kind of aloof, and that's kind of what's interesting about her, and it works in anime. But with cinema, like I said earlier, you need to be able to you know get into that character. So and she's. She's very clever at kind of allowing us just those little moments where we get in and then she kind of hardens and pushes us away again and kind of keeps that dynamic going. And I think she's really, you know, she really changes from the beginning of the film to the end, to the end of the film. And, and physically, I mean, she's, she really, you know, became the major. I mean, it was a, we worked together in New Zealand for three months before we started shooting on, on you know she'd been training like like crazy to get herself in the physical shape and martial arts and she really she really looks you know looks the part and she's incredible she's one of the few people who can uh, fire a, um, a full clip of, a, of an automatic machine gun without uh, without closing her eyes it's quite um, it's quite quite something to watch and she's incredibly um, good at uh, pulling punches and you know, like inches of millimeters away from people, she repeatedly punch, 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 and it's, it's terrifying to to watch. But she's really, you know, she really became the major. She really, be, you know, had the physicality and had the kind of the hidden anger and the hi hidden humanity. It was it's a really an intoxicating character for her, I think. With Pilu, you know, when I first sat down with him, I knew he was Batu. He's got this great kind of gruff sense of humor and kind of uh, he, he's kind of big and bear-like and he's got this kind of very gentle kind of sense of humor to him and, and sensitivity that I really felt Batu had and um, you know he's got this he has to have this very imposing uh, physicality yeah he's just a very magnetic character and, and, and Scarlett and he just 
you know, really kind of found each other so quickly. They they really on screen they were so great together. It was it was it's, it's a very beautiful relationship. It's the classic unrequited love with them. You know, they you know she's kind of machine eight, so they can't really have a relationship. And I think that she sees him in a brotherly way, but he wants to see her not in a sisterly way. So they've got this beautiful. He's a protector to her, you know, and he's he's. He's got a real kind of understanding of her. It's always unspoken in, in all of the, the, um, the materials so far, and we, we kept that. You know, there's a, there's a, he's very respectful of her, and he'd never, he'd never like, you know, he'd never cross the line with her. And I think she does love him, but I think she's, you know, she's coming to terms with what love means anyway. So, you know, maybe further down the line in another universe, Batu and Major will run off into the woods together. We wanted to have a kind of origin story with Batu and see where the eyes came from and, and it's kind of, it, there's a very sweet scene where he, he gets kind of repaired and his eyes get stitched back on and he, uh, and Major kind of smiles at, at the ones he's chosen but he's very happy like a kid who's just got a Swiss army knife. He's got all these things he can do with them. And it was, um, it was very important, again, to do them with prosthetics and have them in camera so that there's, you know, that we're not augmenting him digitally. But it's hard, you know, and I think another thing we wanted to see, the Pilu from before, the Batu from before with his eyes, because, you know, an actor, you're handcuffing them so much without their eyes. I mean, both actors, Scarlett and Pilu, felt kind of handcuffed because, and that was the challenge of both of their roles, Pilu, his eyes are taken away, so he can't do anything with his eyes, so everything has to be gestural. And Major kind of, you know, couldn't start playing with a matchstick or kind of, you know, scratching or doing any of those actor traits that you kind of, that are your uh, crutch in a way, you know. She, she has to be quite, you know, which is very hard because you're kind of acting in a straitjacket. Um, so they both had a lot of, like, things taken away from them in the arsenal of, of the actor. But he came fully immersed. I mean, he'd been, like Scarlett, he'd, he'd been... He'd eaten raw food for three months. He'd been doing uh, boxing and Pilates every day, so he was whip it thin and ripped. You know, his and he, he developed a, uh, a very um, in-depth character. He was he'd uh, <coughs> built himself a little kind of house in a uh, shipping container on the back lot, where he had a punch bag and an ashtray were the two things. That he, and then he did a lot of painting and painting after painting after painting about Kuze and he had all these notebooks and, you know, he really inhabited that character. Um, and it was, you know, it's hard because he doesn't have much time in the film to really make an impression. And I think, you know, in, in the two scenes he has, two, three scenes he has, he really punches home. And, 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 and it's a hard character too because he's not, you know, it's very easy to play, not very easy, but it's, it's, it's easier to play a villain or easier to play the kind of the lost love, but he's playing so many things in so, many, so short a space of time that you know it's a real, real masterclass watching him. And he's very, he's very intense and, and dynamic. She plays Dr. Ouellette, who is the the head of Hanka Robotics and really is the mother of of uh, the major. She built her. She's really impassioned about trying to save humanity. She believes that we. We won't, we won't exist if we don't evolve beyond our mortal kind of human sh forms. She's trying to preserve humanity, but in a way she's had to be conflicted by being funded by the military who wants something different. So the things that she is seeing in the major, these glitches that are memories, fragments from her past, she is having to uh, um, destroy for the military side of the operation, but she secretly knows that that's what she's really thriving for because she's, she's knowing that humanity is surviving through, through the, the transformation from human to machine. Juliet was the first person I, I, I thought of for the role because I think she is, she's such an emotional actress and I felt we really needed someone um, to be the emotional side of the major. Um, and Juliet said no many times. <laughs> Um, but eventually, you know, we, we worked on the script together, we worked on the character together, and, and she came aboard, thankfully, because she's amazing in the film, and I think um, she, she provides so much of that emotion that I really hope she would. It was a wonderful relationship working with her. She's, she's amazing and very funny. 
Takeshi Kitano plays um, Aramaki, who's the head of Section 9, who, who um, much like Juliet as an actor, I've grown up admiring you know, so many of his films as an actor and, as a, and, and a director. And so, you know, when I was first talking about Ghost in the Shell, he was one of the first people I wanted to bring into the project. Because um, he so, to me, was, was had that... I, I, I didn't want Aramaki to be um, a uh, non-active member of the group. I liked the idea that he was, like, probably one of the toughest lot toughest of the lot you know he'd been through his own own wars and battles himself and he still rocks an old revolver but he's he's incredibly efficient with it and he's kind of the patriarch to major and I think it's you know she's got this kind of strange and dysfunctional inherited family and um, Takeshi was just a, a, a dream to work with you know such an incredible um, incredible actor who, who just understands the power of what he's capable of my relationship really stemmed through um, Richard Taylor, or as I should call him as an Englishman, Sir Richard Taylor. Um, he's, you know, an incredible mind. He's one of those kind of people that, you know, when in filmmaking you do touch kind of technology, science and art, and he's one of the people who kind of crosses all of those. And he's really, um, he's kind of, you know, I, I, I don't use the word lightly, but he is quite a genius kind of, practically and, and scientifically and kind of artistically and we had conversations with him very early on um, and it just seemed like he was someone I really wanted to be involved with um, and, and have his team work on the film not just to like make stuff but to have as like people to talk to about it. The thermoptic again very iconic to the film and it kind of it's it's the way that, that Major kind of sneaks up on onto him. So we shot the sequence with with Major and with a um, with the skinny man and then we just basically erase Major from it and, and just use kind of disturbance in, in place because you want to get a feeling that she's there but you don't want her to be completely invisible. Um, so you see where she's splashing in the water, you see her approach. Um, he knows there's something out there, he doesn't know what or where she is, so he's firing wildly at her. So it's kind of, there's a nice cat and mouse, she kind of toys with him. Pretty much everything was shot in, in um, Stone Street Studios in, in Wellington, New Zealand, which was built um, by Peter Jackson as he did uh, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. We did one big scene, the trash truck exterior was done in Wellington. So we called it Welling Kong, where we, create, where we used as much of Wellington as we could and we augmented digitally um, with set extension. And then uh, most of our exterior stuff was kind of jammed into a very succinct and crazy 10-day uh, shoot in, in, uh, in Hong Kong at the end, which was uh, great because it really gives the film that texture. Obviously the original blueprint from Ghost in the Shell is Masamune Shiro's title of the same name which was really our kind of bible going forward and when Oshi was making the anime that was obviously you know his bible too and it's 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 really amazing to see the the still frame from the manga into a still frame from the anime into a still frame of the live action film there's a real continuity that that I think is shows how shows testimony to what he did you know well, nearly what is it now 90, nearly 40 years ago um, that still is culturally relevant to where we are today. So it's incredible how ahead of the time he was in, in the space that he's operating in, in the kind of the cyber terror world. Is, is, and we're starting to see it, you know, more and more as we sit in this election campaign now. We're seeing more and more that people are pulling strings digitally from afar and WikiLeaks. And so it's very timely.